All right, well, in just a moment here, we're going to jump back into our discussion of enterprise systems. Last time, we started talking about the key elements of organizational data, and we wrapped up our discussion in particular with things related to financial accounting and sales. And today, we will jump back into that discussion, but turning our attention first to procurement, any questions about uh, anything before we get started for today? All right, well hopefully your lab work uh, continues to go well for you and you're staying on track with things as the semester starts to kind of pick up speed here. All right, well jumping back into our discussion, uh, kind of a preliminary discussion on organizational elements that we see within companies. Uh, let's talk for a second here about procurement, and we'll just touch on this very briefly at this point since we'll spend a an entire discussion talking in much more detail about things related to procurement. Procurement is actually segregated in ERP systems into two distinct entities. We have the purchasing organization which is the part of the organization that is responsible for going out and procuring materials and services. So the key functionality of the purchasing organization is to engage in negotiation, to set pricing conditions, to engage in purchasing from a strategic perspective, and to establish contracts with our vendors. So keep in mind here, we're talking about purchasing here. And so this purchasing organization is responsible for procurement from a strategic perspective. They are responsible for the negotiation, for the contracting, for thinking about purchasing from a strategic perspective. Now, purchasing organizations are interesting. Most of the organizational elements that we have talked about have a particular place that they can fit in to our overall organization. For example, company codes are assigned to a client. Plants are assigned to a company code. But a purchasing organization can be assigned to a client, can be assigned to a company code, or can be assigned to a plant, or a single purchasing organization could actually be assigned to a combination of these. And this is an example of where how we configure this depends upon how we have structured our overall purchasing from a strategic point of view as an organization. So let me ask you this, based on my statement here that we can assign a purchasing organization to a client, a company code, or a plant. Which of these options would represent the most centralized way of managing purchasing strategy? Assigning it to a client, a company code, or a plant? Well, let's talk about what I mean when I say which is the most centralized. The most centralized means that across our entire organization, we think of purchasing in terms of us all collaborating together and having one office, perhaps let's say located in the company headquarters, that does all of our purchasing from a strategic perspective. If we were going to operate in that fashion, so we were going to be highly centralized, where would we expect to see the purchasing organization assigned to in our organizational hierarchy? Client. The client level. The opposite end of that spectrum would be in a very decentralized purchasing strategy. A plant might have its own purchasing organization. And that purchasing organization fulfills the strategic aspect of purchasing, but just for that one plant. And so we can, and in fact typically will have multiple purchasing organizations within our company, and some of those might be assigned to the client level, some of those to the company code level, or some of those to the plant level, and we'll dig into that in more detail in a later discussion. 
Now, the important distinction here is the purchasing organization handles purchasing from a strategic point of view. The actual <laughs> buying itself is handled differently. It is handled by a purchasing group. And a purchasing group is either a team or individual that actually goes out and <coughs> buys things for our company. Now, now, what do I mean by the distinction? Well, maybe in our organization, we use a lot of, oh, let's say, um, eight and a half by 11 blank paper. And in our overall organization, we'll use several thousand cases of that a year. So what we do as an organization is we go to various paper companies and we negotiate pricing with them. That pricing will be negotiated by the purchasing organization because they handle all of that from a strategic perspective. And they might sign a contract with a particular provider for them to be the company that we exclusively purchase all of our printer paper from. Then when it's time for paper to actually be purchased, the purchasing group though, is the group that actually crafts the purchase orders and sends those out, and they actually do what's called calling off orders against a contract. And so the purchasing organization engages in strategic purchasing, but they don't actually, if you will, get their hands dirty with the actual buying process. You could imagine that the purchasing organization might consist of lawyers, might consist of people who primarily engage in negotiation, might include some economists, for example. The purchasing group itself, though, is people who just engage in the buying process. Now, what's interesting about the purchasing group is they're not directly associated with an organizational entity. In fact, purchasing groups are assigned to a given material on a material master. So a purchasing group is assigned to a material on the material master. Questions about any of that? All right, so kind of ironic since we just had a quiz, but let's ask ourselves some more questions here, some of which seem to have a relationship to things on the quiz. Master data is created at the client level. Is that true or false? True. That is true. Very good. Uh, it is possible for some configuration information to span across multiple clients. Is that true or false? True. That is in fact true. They are very, very rare, but it is technically possible for configuration information to span across multiple clients. Financial accounting focuses on which organizational entity? This question kind of looks familiar. Uh, what's the answer to that one? Company, company code. Just in your mind, financial accounting equals company code. Uh, a purchasing group is responsible for actually executing the purchasing process and buying things. So this gets back to something we talked about, oh, maybe 90 seconds ago. What's the answer to this one? That is true. The purchasing group buys things. The purchasing organization negotiates things and engages in establishing a purchasing strategy. Yes, sir? We have people that are part of both the organization and the group. Run that by me again. Can we have people in the organization that are both part of the organization as well as the purchasing group? I, I wouldn't see why not. Absolutely, that, that's possible. In carrying out their different roles, they would have different codes within the system, but it could be the same person who's doing that. Just like you could technically have someone who's both the head of marketing and the head of a plant, you know, a plant manager. It's not necessarily typical, but yeah, we can absolutely do things like that if we want to. Okay, so we have spent some time here talking about organizational data and, and uh, setting the stage for some things that we are going to dig into in much more detail as the semester goes along. What we are now going to do is talk about material data and the material master. You had a question on your homework that asked you some questions about this, and, and most of you gave some pretty good answers. Um, I don't know to what degree a lot of you really understood the significance of what you were, were actually writing, and so we want to look at this in, in great detail here and understand how master data is managed within enterprise information systems. We have already established 
that master data is created at what level? Client level. So master data is actually created centrally and shared amongst applications and processes. And, and what do I mean by that? Well, if you think about it, I'm drawing a Venn diagram here, here, here's the client, and everything within the system is in with the client. And then in our system, we might have two company codes, and those two company codes might each have two plants, and then those plants uh, have storage locations inside of them. And then we just talked about purchasing groups that could exist at the client level or the company code or the plant level. So we might have, for example, a purchasing organization at the client level. We might have a purchasing organization at the company code level. We might have a purchasing organization at the plant level. It can go lots of different places. But master data always exists within the scope of the entire client. So if you will, uh, we would put master data out at this level in our overall structure of how we think about this. Now that does not mean that every one of these entities sees this in exactly the same fashion because of the way this data is, is actually organized. What we see is, for example, a customer master record contains information about the relationship between a company, or more formally we might say a company code, and a customer. So what I'm telling you is that means that a customer record, we'll abbreviate it by saying CR, a customer record gets created at the client level. But depending upon how we are looking at that customer record, we will see different things. What do I mean by that? Well, let's, let's use as a metaphor here a, a three-dimensional object, okay? I am holding a three-dimensional object up. It is a uh, whiteboard eraser probably costs about 75 cents or five dollars I have no idea how much but but you all can see this right okay now when you look at this eraser and I look at this eraser we're both looking at the same eraser but we're not seeing the same thing and technically if you really get at this from an optical point of view, the people on this side of the room are seeing something different from the people on other sides of the room. Imagine if instead of me holding up this eraser, I was holding up something that had lots of different facets to it and carves out and things like that, and you looked at it and other people looked at it. Each of us might actually see different things than we look at. This is kind of reminiscent of that a joke about what is it, the blind people who find an elephant and they all feel different parts of the elephant, they all think it's different things. Well, the idea here is that master data is created at the client level, but depending upon what entity it is that's looking at this, they will actually see different information. And so we need to dig into exactly how that happens. Master data is segmented into what is called a view. And every view is assigned to different organizational elements. What that does is that mapping determines which aspect of the master data is used in various processes. So let's talk about this in theory. Um, we have said that data at the client level is shared among all company codes. So let's, for the moment, talk about our customer record here. There is certain basic data about our customer that would be universal. A good example of that might be the name of the customer. Let's assume the customer in question is a business and so they're called Acme Anvils. <clears throat> now, because that is basic data about this customer, 
if I look at that from company code A's perspective, or company code B's perspective, or the client's perspective, I, all of us see the exact same thing. We see that the name of this company is Acme Anvils because that falls into the category of being basic data. Financial accounting is company code specific. Okay, so think with me here. This is a customer. <laughs> what information falls into the category of financial accounting that I track on a customer by customer basis? Not, not too hard a question, don't overcomplicate it. What do I keep track of in my company on a customer by customer basis that's uh, financial accounting related, that relates to money? Accounts receivable. Accounts receivable, how much they owe us, right? So, I have one customer, Acme Anvils. They are account number 10274. When I look at that customer record from company code A, I see how much they owe us. When I look at that customer record from company code B, I see how much they owe us, and those are likely two different numbers. Because those numbers are independent of one another, because financial accounting happens at the company code record, or at the company code level. Therefore, the amount that the customer owes us, even though it's the same customer record, when we look at it, depending upon what part of the organization we are looking at it from, we see different information. Sales data is specific to a particular <coughs> sales area. So for example, I didn't even put this on my whiteboard diagram here, every company code has the ability to have multiple sales areas. And remember, a sales area is a combination of what? Sales organization, distribution channel, and division. So we might have one sales area, two sales area, three sales area. When I look at this customer record from inside of, we'll just call this sales area one, I see our sales information. But I don't see other groups' sales area information, and I certainly don't see information from other company codes. So it's the same record. It's the same piece of master data. But that customer master is going to look different depending upon how it is that I am electing to look at it in the system. That is one of the key elements to information management in the system. You have actually seen this about a half a dozen times in your labs, perhaps without realizing what you were actually seeing. And we will dig into it in much greater emphasis here because this is a key facet of understanding how information is organized and manipulated and managed within an enterprise information system. This is also a key facet for how the system manages information security and role management. Meaning, for example, if Bob Smith is an employee that works in this sales area, well, Bob Smith would be authorized, of course, to find out the name of the customer and other basic information. And then he would be authorized to look at the information in that sales record, should be that customer record, that belongs to his sales area. But he would likely not be authorized to look at it based on information from another sales area or what's going on in regards to another company code. If I work for company code B as a financial accountant, I have great interest and ownership over my company's relationship with Acme Anvils, but I have no part in that customer's relationship with my fellow company code over here. So I can't see that information. And so that's a key element for how things are, are managed and, and segregated. So 
I did my example here based on the customer master. Let's change gears and talk about a different master record. Material master. The material master is segmented into 12 different views. <coughs> And I'll actually show you this in the system in just a few moments here. The most universal view, and the view that we always have to populate with at least some information, is the basic data view. The basic data view is available universally. It is shared client-wide, and it contains the basic data about a given material, which would include things like the name of the material. And we'll look at other things here in a few moments that are a part of the material master. Other views, their data may differ, may differ, excuse me, among organizational entities. Okay, so what do I mean by that? Let's come back to that for a moment. No matter where I am in the system, if I look at this material, we're all going to see the same basic data. That is universal. But for the data in the other views, what I see may be different from what a colleague sees because we may work in different company codes. We may work in different plants and so on. So the basic data view is universal. The other views are dependent upon what is the view is, is capturing. So we have the basic data view, the MRP data view, the plant data view, the financial accounting data view, storage data view, warehouse management data, purchasing data, sales data, work scheduling data, quality management data, forecasting data, and classification data. Now, let's just start looking at this in our ERP system. So give me a moment here to get logged in to the system. And oh, that would help if I actually typed my password. Okay, so I want to look at material data. Logistics, material management, material master, material. And notice I here I have the ability to create, uh, create special, create general, flag for deletion. Oh, but let's talk about this for a second. You guys do realize that nothing can be deleted out of our system, right? You can't delete things out of an enterprise information system. You can do things like flag things for deletion, which means that they would actually be archived the next time an archival run is done, and archival runs are never done on our system. So you can't delete things, <coughs> but you do see transactions like this flag for deletion, which doesn't actually delete the item, but flags it as, okay, at some point in the future when we do archival, we, we want to get rid of that. Let's go into display, though. And I want to display, notice I can look at a material right now, or I could look at a material as it existed on a specified date, perhaps a date in the past or the future, but we're just going to look at the current state of materials. Okay, and so I need to look up a particular material in the system. Now I think, I wrote down some of our materials here, I think we have, is it O-R-M-N, oh there we go, okay. ORMN1002 is a man's off-road bike. Notice some things that are right here at the top of the screen. Select view, organizational level, and then we just have a miscellaneous data button. Well, watch what happens if I don't hit any of those buttons and I just type in the material and press enter. The system asks me, okay, what view do you want to see? And notice all of my choices here that reflect what we just talked about a few moments ago with the understanding that some of these views are so complicated they're broken out across multiple screens. So what we said a moment ago was the MRP view is actually broken out here, MRP 1, 2, 3, and 4. 
But there's all the things we talked about a moment ago that I could select as what I want to see related to this view. So what I'm going to do here, just for the sake of a moment, is I am going to deselect all of the views except for the two basic data views. And remember we said that that is now going to be universal. No matter where I am in the organization, we're all going to see the same thing. So I hit enter, and here's the basic data view. The basic data view is the material code, the name of the material, what material group it's in, what division it belongs to, base unit of measures, I track bicycles by the each. You know, some things I might track based on weight, gallon, other things of that sort. We see the weight, gross and net weight of the bicycle. You'll notice that there's a lot of fields here that have no data in them. And what gets populated and what doesn't get populated is totally up to me and my organization based on how I want to keep track of things. For example, it's very, very common to track the weight of items because if we're going to be shipping these things out, that would be a key factor in calculating how much it's going to cost to ship. Interestingly enough, we have elected not to track the volume of the item. <clears throat> that could be relevant for some other materials. Now you'll notice that with these views, we have a pretty full screen here, but the reason why this is broken up into basic data one and basic data two is so that for the most part it's going to fit on one screen. So this is the basic data one screen. This is the basic data two screen. So we are looking at things in the basic data view, and you'll notice that pretty much nothing is populated here on the basic data view to screen. But notice, design documents assigned, if we kept schematics for items in our system, we could link to them from here, we could link to design drawings, we could link to all kinds of information about this material that we might want to keep track of in our company. Now notice, the other views are reflected in these tabs across the top. And so, for example, at this point, I could try to change views. And let's say, for example, I wanted to look at the accounting information about this material. Okay? This is financial accounting. So uh, you'll notice I have an accounting one and an accounting two view. Accounting is tracked based on what organizational entity? Company, company, company code. I switch the accounting code one view, and notice this. This is kind of interesting. You would expect it would ask me, well, what, what company code do you want to track this at? But it actually asks me what plant I want this information for realizing that plants are attached to company codes. <coughs> and so it's going to give me information about inventory valuation and other things of that sort at, at the plant level. So let me show you an example of what I'm talking about when I say different, different organizational entities will see different things depending upon what they're looking at. Now our system is very wide open because it's an academic system. And so, in fact, you and I could at any point, you know, we could type in any old plant here. Hopefully this will not happen this semester. It hasn't happened so far. But a couple of years ago, I had a student who really, really massively messed up, messed up his lab work. And as a result, disrupted the work of several other students in the class because we're all basically operating at the highest level of authority. So let's just say, for example, that, that your company code 22, and you have a Miami plant, and you happen to know that your Miami plant MI22. So you type that in, and you're told, hey, that material doesn't exist in that plant. Well, hold on a second. I thought that material data was universal and everybody could see it. 
Well, everybody could see it, but when you say, I want to look at it in the context of this plant, this plant doesn't know about financial accounting information because it's not a material that exists in the content of plant MI-22. Now this, in fact, is one of my materials. I am company code 02. So let's say, for example, I want to look at this in terms of my Dallas plant. So I type in DL02. I hit enter, and it tells me that from an accounting perspective, this is valuation class 7920. The moving price is $1,200. Standard price is $1,200. I price these per unit, and the current accounting period is September of 2016. This product is in the bicycle division, and, and so on. It is showing me that information based on plant, Dallas 02. So let's say, oh, well, let's, let's look at a different view here. Let's look at the storage location view. Now it asks me, okay, you want to see the storage information view for what plant and what storage location. So notice, as I am traversing the material master, this is the same record, but depending upon what organizational data I specify, that governs what perspective I have on this master record and gives me, in fact, different information. So if I said, okay, show me this product in terms of the Dallas plant raw materials, it says, uh, sorry, that, that item does not exist in the context of that storage location. Now let's say this is a bicycle. A bicycle would clearly not be raw materials. So let me see if I go in here and change this from raw materials in Dallas to finished goods in Dallas. And now I have information. And in fact, it tells me that in this storage location, I have no stock. <coughs> I have nothing. You can see nothing but zeros here. And, and that's because I'm looking at this in the context of my Dallas plan. Suppose you say, well, I want to look at it from the perspective of another plan. OK, that's what this organizational levels button's for. Mm -hmm. So let's say I want to change that and I want to look at it for my San Diego plant. So I change that to San Diego, and you'll notice I get a different answer. When I look at this material master record from the San Diego plant perspective, I have 100 of these sitting in finished goods inventory, totally unrestricted. We'll talk about all of these things in a future discussion here, but basically I've got 100 bicycles ready to go ready for someone to buy them. So this is an example of, we have the same master record, and when we get ready to look at it, we can choose which views we want to see, and we can choose which organizational entity we want to view this from. And that's a key element for how this information is organized. That's why when you do things like sell a product, you have to specify that you're going to ship it from this plant from this particular storage location. Because inventory is tracked at the storage location <coughs> level. Where this gets potentially tricky and where you really have to pay attention in your lab work to make sure you don't make a mistake is if all your bicycles are sitting in San Diego and you try and sell them out of the Dallas plant, you might get all kinds of weird messages from the system saying, I don't know anything about that bicycle. What are you talking about? I don't have any ladies red bicycles. And it's because that particular material only exists in a different organizational context. So the material master segmented into these 12 views. The basic view is universal. Everything else, what I see, is going to be dependent upon my organizational entity that I'm viewing the material from. One of the key things that is tracked on the material master is the material type. You got a homework question about this. Most of you gave very, very good answers to this. The material type classifies materials 
based on how we use them. And the second part of this sentence is very important. The material type determines which views are populated for a given material. <coughs> and by that I mean, it determines the views that are a part of the material master record. Now, we're going to dig into this in more detail, and I'll put it on the slide here in just a moment. But think with me for a moment. One of the material types that you know about, because you answered questions about it for homework, is a raw material. Somebody tell me something notable about raw materials. Where do raw materials come from? Supplier. I buy them from a supplier, right? So, would we expect to see purchasing related views for a material of type raw material? Yes, we buy raw materials, therefore we're going to see purchasing related views. I don't know that your reading covered this. Can we sell raw materials? No. Raw materials are exclusively bought for use in production. If we sell it, it's something else. It's not a raw material. Raw materials are bought and used as a component in production. Like I said, I'm, that's, you're going to see that on a PowerPoint slide here in just a moment. But what that means is, if I go and look at sales-related views, the system's going to say those views don't exist. Because this is a raw material, you don't sell raw materials. So depending upon the type of the material is going to determine which views can be populated with information. Yes, sir? So... So, say for example, so we obviously sell bikes, but um, we put together the bikes, so we buy bike chains from the supplier. Um, so, would you have to have two, and then, well, and then since we're a bike company, we also sell those bike chains. So, would they just be two separate entities in the system? We would have bike chains that are raw materials, and we would have bike chains that we might classify as a trading good. And we could, should we need to, um, on our side of things, move some from being raw material to being a trading good. But they would actually be two different material numbers in the system. Yes, sir? Would it be safe to say that for a material to be classified as a raw material that we're always purchasing it from somewhere? Um, Like, who is actually to, uh, like, be the mining company? That pulls yeah, it a out mining of the company, I think, mines things out of the ground. I think that would be classified as a raw material. And then we use that material to make something else. Yeah. We I, still classify that as raw. I, I think we would still classify it as a raw material. Now, what's important, the reason why I'm hesitant here is we're going to talk about the major material types. There's a whole bunch that are more nuanced and advanced that we may look at, but we won't talk about. But I think it's likely that a mining company, for example, would classify coal as a raw material. Okay. Good question. Other questions? Yes. Uh, one more question. Uh, so say in the automotive industry, how, say, let's take Honda, uh, how they have raw materials, but or in those raw materials will build a car. <coughs> uh, well, cars will need repair like often. So will those raw materials in industry, is it a standard for raw materials to not only be raw materials, but uh, piggybacking off his question, be finished good products too, so you can repair those products? That would not be unusual. It would okay. be two different material masters, two different material numbers, with a, a clear relationship between them. Yeah. Yep. Okay. And and I'll I'll give you some more examples of that as as we go along here. Okay. So yeah, you guys are are thinking of the right questions and along the lines here. So material types. Classify materials based on company usage and determine which views are populated. The material type determines the views that appear in the material master record, what material number is assigned. Now, this is at the option of the company. 
But you could, for example, say that materials of this type always begin with this number and materials of this other type always begin with this number so that if someone just sees the material numbers, a lot of times they know certain things inherently about that material. So the material type determines what material number. The material type determines what procurement types are allowed. Is this something, and this gets back to what we were just talking about here, related to a mining company and coal and so on. Are we procuring something from an external source? Are we procuring it in-house? Meaning, are we procuring it by you know, digging it out of the ground? The material type tells us how we get certain things into our organization. And the material type will also govern things like how general ledger accounts are updated. For example, in this room, uh, this eraser that I have referred to was bought from a company. It was bought by ETSU. The company that sold this to us undoubtedly had a material type associated with this, a material number as a result of that. But this is a pretty low value product right here. As opposed to the computer, which is sitting here in the podium at the front, which clearly has a lot more expense to it. In terms of financial accounting, are we talking about a cost, which is an expendable item, or are we talking about an asset, which we depreciate over time? The material type tells us that information as well. Now, materials can be combined into material groups to ease planning. Let me give you an example of this. This is something you will do in your labs very, very late in the semester, and by then we'll have moved on to other things. So, so let's talk about this for a moment here. Let's suppose for a moment that you work for Dell, okay? And Dell, of course, sells computers. So, they might have a group, a material group, that they just call <coughs> computers. I'll abbreviate here as COM. And when we look inside of that group, we see that there are two other groups. We see desktop, and we see laptop, and, and we'll actually break it into three here, and, and they see tablet. Now those are groups too. And then when we look in desktops, we might see a group called PC1000. That's a product group, and inside of that, now we actually get to individual materials, and here is product PC1001, PC1002, PC1003, PC1004, okay? Now, we could create a hierarchical structure like this in our organization to group together materials into material groups. This is a key to planning things. Because let's assume for the sake of argument that Dell has in their overall computing grouping here 1,000 different models. And your job is to forecast sales and to plan future production. Okay, so you can leverage your knowledge of ERP SIM to help you with this. How much fun would it be to create a sales forecast for all 1,000 models? And that would take a long time, right? So here's how we do this. We leverage our knowledge and we, if we were Dell, might say, you know, historically, 40% of our sales have been desktops, and 40% or 30% have been tablets, and 30% have been laptops. And we could look back historically and track that and have a pretty good idea. So let's assume for the moment that we're talking about next quarter, and next quarter we expect to sell 100,000 computers. So how many desktop computers are we expecting to sell based on the facts that I've given you? 40,000. 40,000. And laptops, 30,000. And tablets, 30,000. Now all I had to do 
was come up with the big picture estimate of sales. And then after that, it just becomes mathematical here to figure out the proportions. Well, we continue. In our desktop group, we have five different groups that I'm not going to draw here on the whiteboard. And we know that 15% of the sales go here, and 5%, and 15%, and 10%, and whatever the difference is, is here. And then all of these groups have individual products in it, and we know the proportionality here. So all of this becomes a matter of specifying proportions, which means that I can just create a big picture sales estimate and then tell the computer, OK, you translate that into how many units I'm going to sell of each of these products. Oh, and when you're done, figure out what I need to buy to make all of those guys. That's the virtue of having material groups. Now, material groups are of my own definition. Material types have very standard definitions. Material groups, I can define any old way I want. And in fact, I could have the same material show up in lots of different groups. You know, I might create a group that looks like this for the use of, of sales planning. I might create another group that breaks things out in different ways for the perspective of managing production, whatever have you. But the idea here is that I can take materials and put these in these material groups just to make my life and planning a lot easier. And groups can contain other groups like you see here. We can create these hierarchies. And what it does is it makes our life a whole lot easier than thinking of things on an individual product level. Yes, sir. Um, as far as uh, depreciation goes, and is, is it fair to say that organizations, they have a plan or an algorithm that says if a product is below a certain value, we wouldn't spend time trying to depreciate it or anything like that and just go with a bigger? You are somewhat limited or bound by a uh, <coughs> gap, generally accepted accounting principles or IF. IFRS principles or whatever have you. So you can't just say, oh, I think that building over there that's worth $10 million is not an asset. I'm just going to write off as an expense. You can't do that. But uh, within the set of guidelines that you're given, there's a whole lot of latitude. For example, just in the organizations that I've worked with, um, I know two organizations, one of which would consider the furniture in this room to be an expense, and another that would consider the furniture in this room to be an asset just a different organizational strategy for how they classify those things. So we do have a great deal of, of latitude here. Just one last example or one last comment related to material groups. Um, this is probably about five years ago, I was in a presentation where uh, an executive from Steelcase was talking about their material planning that they do. And by the way, what I put on the whiteboard in some way relates to MRP, which we will talk about at great length this semester. Um, he mentioned that a typical MRP run for Steelcase would evaluate over 1.5 different consumer products at a time. There's no way that a human could sit down and create 1.5 million individual sales forecasts. But what they do is they use these product groups based on knowledge that they have about products that have sold, and they use that to engage in, in planning. Just as a silly example of that, Coke machines, all of you know what I'm talking about. Have you ever walked up to a Coke machine and seen where it has, you know, like it has the ability to vend 10 different products, but three of those slots are filled with Coca-Cola? It's not 10 distinct flavors. Um, I worked at a university a number of years ago that changed their purveyor from Pepsi to Coke, and Coke came in and said, we will put X number of vending machines on your campus. And they said, in addition to that, we will tell you how to manage the proportionality of drinks in those machines. Coke knows that for every one hand, 100 cans of, 
of soda they sell at a vending machine, they know what percentage of that is going to be Coke versus Pepsi versus what Sprite and other things like that. I mean, they've got that information because of experience. It's a good example of how knowing proportions really eases the, the planning process here. Okay, back to material related things. So this is something that's very similar to what I just drew on the whiteboard here. This is from your textbook and actually shows a hierarchy that you will create very late in the semester where you're going to have a product group at the top. I don't know what your product group will be called, but it will leverage your unique number. And inside of that will be a bicycles and an accessories group. And inside of bicycles will be a touring bicycles and an off-road bicycles groups. And inside of touring bicycles will be deluxe touring bikes and professional touring bikes. And we just create this hierarchy as a way of organizing things for keeping track of our materials. Any questions about this? Yes? Um, I'm not 100% sure of an example of why you would do something like this, but could you change? So obviously, um, those bikes have different materials that are used to make them, mm -hmm. right? So for example, um, let's say all of them use the same chain for some reason. Could you change the chain based on the based on the classification of just touring bikes? Or would you have to go in and change for both sets of... Um, well, from an information management perspective, the chain would be specified on the bill of materials. You could go in and do bulk maintenance on a set of bills of materials. So I think you could accomplish what you're trying to, to talk about there. And groups <coughs> might a way to help you with that. I'd have to think, though, about the actual transactional logistics of that, though. But I think it's safe to say you, you can use a material group to facilitate things like that. Other questions? Okay, so material groups, remember the big thing here. Generally, you know, it's kind of misleading. Your, your book gave me a definition. Material groups are when you put things together that have things in common. Or it gave you a really weak definition like that. And that's true. But that's more specific than reality. Reality is a material group is a group that has materials in it, and you get to decide what you put there. You know, you could create a, a material group called My Favorite Things and put a bicycle in it and a helmet in it and a t-shirt in it. And the only thing those products have in common is that they are on your wish list for Santa Claus this year. I mean, a, a material group can be composed of any old thing that we want and the hierarchy in any old way we want to do it. Material types, though, are much more precisely defined. Material types classify the materials based on company usage. So, some materials can be used differently by different organizational levels. What do I mean by that? Well, let's stick with our bicycle example. So here's our client. And here's company code A. And we're just going to focus on them for right now. And they have plant one, plant two, and plant three. Now, plant three makes bicycles. And they make the finished bicycle that you ride out the door and you sell to customers. But as we well know, there's a lot of different components that have to go into the manufacture of that <coughs> bicycle, one of which is bike chains. Now, so let's talk about bike chains for a moment. In the context of plant three, a bike chain is a raw material. But in the context of plant one, they buy metal and forge it, and they make bike chains. That's what plant one does. Plant one makes bike chains and a half dozen other products. So in the context of bike, cha of, of bike chains, plant one bike chains are actually a finished good. 
they buy metal and other stuff, and what comes out the end of their assembly line and causes them to say, yay, we're done, we can sell this, or we can ship it off someplace else, are our bike chains. So a bike chain could be a raw material, or it could be a finished good, depending upon how we use it in a given organizational level. Let's talk about this. How in one furt and another? Okay, what's the deal here with these guys? These are material type definitions. There are a lot of them. You do not need to know all of them, but there are a few of them that come up with great, great regularity. And so I'll give you what those are here in just a moment. But for right now, let's do this. Let's go back to our ERP system. And let's look at the process of making a new material. By the way, something that you don't do in your labs. You copy materials over, but a material master has a lot of information in it. If you had to create all your material masters from scratch, you would not like that very much. So what you have actually done is you've copied materials from a pre-existing reference company, and then you've changed some things. You've changed the description, you've changed the purchasing group, you've changed some things. So, but let's say we were actually creating something from, from scratch. So logistics, material management, material master, material, and we'll do create special. And notice, as soon as I open that transaction group, it says, oh, okay, what do you want to create? Raw material, semi-finished product, finished product, operating supply, trading good, non-valuated material, non-stock material, packaging, empties, services, configurable material, maintenance assemblies, competitor products, or returnable packaging. <coughs> and that's not an exhaustive list of all the different material <coughs> types. But notice, as soon as I start the process of saying I want to create a material, pretty much the first thing I have to do is say what type of material I, I am creating. So I might say, well, I want to create a raw material. And it says, oh, oh okay, great. What, what do you want to call this material? Okay. Now I'm company code 02, and so I am going to try and create a material and call it Example, example zero two, industry sector, chemical industry, mechanical engineering, pharmaceuticals, plant engineering and construction, or retail. Well, it's a raw material. I'm going to assume we're going to use it to build stuff. I'm going to say mechanical engineering, and let's go. Okay, so what views do I want to populate here on, on my raw material? So you'll notice that what has happened here is there are views selected. Those are there based on previous defaults I've set. In your lab exercises, you're going to do this a lot. The lab will say, you know, check certain views and then click default setting so that those views are highlighted in the future. Okay? Um, but I'm going to cancel that and hit enter again. These are the ones that were pre-selected for me based on wherever I was last working in the lab sequence, and I said make these default. So notice what, what it shows here. Basic data one, sales, sales organizational data one, sales general plant data, and, and purchasing. Well, let's just go with that for the moment and see what happening. So I hit the check mark, and it says, okay, Tell me, um, tell me how you want to, you know, handle this. And I'll say, okay, uh, the Miami Distribution Center is going to deal with this. U.S. East for my sales organization is going to sell it. I'm going to sell it wholesale. Now, some of this, I could say, okay, well, what if I, what if I, I don't specify the distribution channel? What if I just leave that blank? And so I hit check mark here, and uh, that's not a valid sales area. Now you might say, hold on a second, why is it asking me about sales areas? It's asking me about sales areas because I said I wanted to create sales-related views. <laughs> if I come back here and say, no, I don't want to create sales-related views. This is a raw material. I don't sell raw materials. I just want to create a basic data view and a purchasing view. Notice now when I hit enter, I get different questions. 
then ask me about the sales area because that's not relevant. So yeah, this particular material um, we'll deal with at the, the Miami plant. All right, so now I have to give it a name and this is 02 class example. Me and caps lock just never get along class example. Notice what I have to specify. This little symbol that shows up in some of the squares are things that I have to fill. So the base unit of measure, whatever this example is, we're going to actually track this um, in acres. Okay? Um, so you know you buy one or two or three acres of example zero two from us. And for material group, now this is where I get myself in trouble and what I pick here, because notice I have predefined material groups here. And so I'm going to potentially shoot myself in the foot and say that this belongs in my wheel assembly group. Okay? And now I can save this or try and save it. And I, I just created that material. So as a part of the material creation process, I had to start off by specifying what kind of material it is. Different plants. Okay, why do we track materials differently in different plants? Let me give you a real world example. We're a multinational company. We have plants here in the United States that receive shipments from international vendors. But only some of our plants are authorized to receive international shipments, and only some of our plants are authorized to ship out internationally. So we might designate materials differently in different plants based on whether they are for sale in the US or for sale abroad. That happens a lot with pharmaceutical products. Same product sold in the U.S. under one name, one set of labels, one distribution process, sold to other countries in a totally different way. We designate that with our material types. Different sales organizations. Some people might be authorized to sell this as a retail product. Some might be authorized to sell it as a wholesale product. Those are the kinds of things that the definition of material type gives us the ability to control. So going back to this idea, the same <coughs> material can be used in lots of different ways in our organization. Maybe we differentiate on a company code level, maybe we differentiate on a plant level, maybe we differentiate on a sales level. The eraser that I've held up several times. Some people, some salespeople are authorized to sell those wholesale, where other salespeople can only sell them retail. All traces back to the type of the material and how I've configured the system. All right, so let's get a little bit more detailed here. Material types determine which views are populated. That fact has shown up now two or three times. I'll give you some examples. Raw materials. The code associated with raw materials is row. If you talk to anyone who worked with SAP for very long and has anything to do with materials, that they'll use that term a lot and expect that you know that row means raw materials and they usually won't even say raw materials they'll just call them row. Raw materials as we observed a moment ago are purchased. We don't sell raw materials. We don't use them in production or we we use them in production. So we buy them, we don't sell them and we use them in production. Therefore they have purchasing related views and they have production related views. But they don't have sales related views. Raw materials don't get sold, no sales related views for that material. <coughs> Halb is a semi finished good. What is a semi finished good? A semi finished good is produced using either raw materials or other semi finished goods. And it is used in the production of other either semi-finished goods or finished goods. So I think in your book, uh, in your labs, you've done things like created a brake assembly. A brake assembly is not a finished good, but it is something that we have manufactured by putting together a variety of raw materials. It's kind of a product that is halfway finished, if you will, <laughs> if you want to think of it that in, in that terms. But a semi-finished good is something that we make using raw materials or other semi-finished goods, and then eventually we'll turn around and use them to make other things. 
semi-finished goods are not bought and they are not sold. So therefore, on the basis of our observing that, we know we have no purchasing related views, we have no sales related views. But we are going to have production related views. And what's not specifically mentioned here, but we've talked about, they're going to have accounting related views because we're going to have to keep track of these guys in the context of, of accounting. Finished goods are, are FERT. These are produced using other materials. So we produce finished goods using either raw materials or semi-finished goods, and, and these are items that we are going to sell to customers. So do we produce finished goods? <coughs> yes, you'll have production-related views. Do we sell finished goods? Yes, you'll have sales-related views. Do we buy finished goods? No. There will not be production-related views for finished goods maintained by the system. The last of the four, and once again, keep in mind, this is not exhaustive. Trading goods. HAWA is the abbreviation for that. This is a material that is purchased and resold without additional processing. So what do I mean by that? Will we have purchasing related views? Yes. Will we have sales related views? Yes. Will we have production related views? No. Okay. So the material type is a critical facet in understanding which views the system will maintain and how that information can therefore be accessed and used across our organization. A lot of people that work with SAP don't understand this, but this is a key element in some of the core information management that's done within the ERP system. Yes, sir, Roger. Is uh, Go, How, Power, are those the acronyms in German? I don't know if they're formally would be considered acronyms or abbreviations, but yes, that's the idea. That if, if we knew what raw materials were, if we knew what that term was translated into German, it probably would be, uh, you know, that's either a shortened form of that word or, or an abbreviation or whatever have you. So yeah, that's the relationship there. This traces back to the, the German language. I don't have written down, and I don't know that I could find off the top of my head uh, an exhaustive, oops, that's not what I wanted to do, an exhaustive list of all the material types, and it looks like my SAP GUI crashed in the background anyhow. So let's just look at one more slide and, and then we'll be done for today. And, and this is a good kind of concluding slide for us anyhow, if I can get PowerPoint to work for me. And that is, okay, so the material master. You, many of you made an observation to this effect in your, in your home. The material master is used in a lot of different processes. The procurement process will use the procurement view. So if you worked in procurement in some capacity, you would have the ability to go in and look at material master records and see likely all of the information in the procurement view. But you might be precluded to only seeing those things. You might be able to see the basic data, so you'd see the name of the material and its material number, and then the procurement related <coughs> views. If you worked in fulfillment or sales, you could probably look at a material and see things like its, its uh, inventory level and things like that. But as an example, most companies don't want their salespeople to know what it costs them to make or to buy a product. And if you go into a car dealership to buy a new car, one of the reasons why the salespeople are handled negotiation the way they do is they have no clue what the dealership paid for that car. And the dealership purposely keeps them ignorant of that fact so that when they try and sell you a car for $35,000 that only costs the dealership $20,000, they can try and convince you that you're getting a really good deal. 
because the dealership knows that if they told their salesman, okay, we paid $20,000 for that, the salesperson would, would try and lower the price to get you to buy the car so the dealership still made money. So one of the things that, that organizations will frequently do is you segregate who knows what about what. Well, the views give us a way of doing that. Production. If you worked in production, you would have access to the production views of a material, but not necessarily the procurement and sales views, because it's none of your business what we're going to sell this for. It's your job just to make it. People that work in material planning would have access to material planning views, but wouldn't it have a, would not have a need to know about maybe sales related views or, or procurement related views. Depends on what we're doing in the context of material planning, but we can keep the information segregated. Asset management. If you're setting up a depreciation schedule for a material, there are certain things that you need to know, but you don't necessarily need to know some of the things that are contained in these other views. So we can compartmentalize the information that's made available. This is an illustration of master data management. In the system, we have this one master data record, this material master. For every, we have one of these for every material we deal with. So there are hundreds, if not thousands, if not millions of these in the system for any given company. And it is a very, very complex data structure from a computer science perspective because it's like, if you will, this big three-dimensional object that has all of these different facets and depending upon who's looking at it, they see different things. But the system tracks that for the sake of master data management. And this is a great place for us to stop. Have a good uh, morning, everyone. And uh, I look forward to seeing you when we get together. If anyone came in late and so you didn't take a quiz, let me know so that I can make record of that for the <coughs>